what are some of the lessons specifically content creator related your relationship with social media and, and this career i would actually say don't do it really mm -hmm. don't do what part don't be a social media creator we live in a world where we're encouraged to pick something and then once we pick it we're encouraged to stick with it forever i don't know about you but that never made a whole lot of sense for me. I've got a lot of interests. I'd like to live a lot of lifetimes. Is that so insane? I know we live in a hyper-specialized world, but there's gotta be a way. It seems to me that priorities change as we grow and evolve. Life likes to throw curveballs. That's what kind of makes it interesting in my view. This has all led me to have a fascination for people that take massive career shifts you know, jumping from one industry to another, essentially embracing the change instead of trying to fight it off. My guest today is Matt Dahlia, formerly known as Matt Daher, one of the four original founders of Yes Theory, the incredibly successful YouTube channel. A couple of years ago, Matt decided to publicly step away from his role on camera with Yes Theory, as well as social media in general. And that was a major topic of our conversation. His book on the journey that he's been on for the last eight or nine years is coming soon. I'll leave a link to the newsletter you can sign up to for free to get updates on when that book is coming out in the show notes or description. All right, before we dive into this conversation, I wanna briefly thank the sponsor of this episode, which is Element. Element is an electrolyte drink mix, and this stuff is amazing. I'll give you two use cases, my two main use cases for this kind of thing. One for athletes and one for non-athletes. The first use case is for running. As many of you know, I recently ran my very first marathon. There was a big learning curve there. One key discovery that I made was how insanely important it is to be properly hydrated, which sounds obvious, but it's actually quite difficult when there's so much other stuff that you're focusing on and running such long distances. Element really helps with that. You can split a pack, drink like the first half before the run and then the second half after the run. And that really helps to avoid cramps or fatigue. The other way electrolytes save me is as a cheat code to avoiding hangovers. Seriously, if you don't do this, you have to give this a shot. Obviously, if you're already hungover, it's good to get properly hydrated. So that's always an option. The way I go about it is drinking a pack of this stuff before I go to bed if I've had a few drinks so that I don't wake up the next morning feeling terrible. There's no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers. Plus they will give you your money back if you don't like it. So it's low risk. You can get a free element sample pack when you make any purchase through the link in the show notes or the description. So check it out if you're interested. Thank you Element for sponsoring this video. And now let's dive into the conversation. You have a great laugh, dude. Really? Yeah, like you have a you have the kind of laugh that allows you like if an awkward thing happens to just relax, you know? Like uh -huh. you're it's very um it's kind of like a full body, very genuine laugh. Oh, thanks, man. And so like, I'll say something dumb and then you'll give this great laugh and I'm like, okay, it doesn't matter, you know, because I can get in my head about stuff sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Oh, that means a lot. Yeah. yeah. I honestly, I think it's the thing I try to do. I mean, just in general for people, I feel like it's important to, you know, yeah. kind of calm the air. Totally. Yeah. So it's an intentional thing. Uh, yeah, I've practiced it for, for years. Really? No. <laughs> well, you, it might be bathroom. an intentional thing. I mean, ha <laughs> <laughs> which one is it? Okay. I mean, obviously yeah, yeah, it's yeah. funny to say that, but, yeah. but, but you, I mean, I see the impact of behaving a certain way and, and how it can help other people relax. Mm. Uh, even in the context of this podcast, I'm like, what are ways that I can kind of help people just be themselves and just be chill? You mm. know, I'd say actually it's probably the most essential ingredient for a podcast host is like because I, I, even for me you know like i haven't been on camera in two years so i'm coming in here like this is a lot yeah you know instantly even though you're one of my best friends yeah so that's why i said like it's going to be a little wobbly at first you know no this and is I think, already awesome yeah, yeah but like letting people instant you know know that that's normal it's like yeah it's just going to be you know we're just gonna feel it's kind of like boxing you're just like yeah but not like boxing. Well, you're setting dancing. expectations a little bit, right? You're just basically like, look, you know. For sure. And well, I think that's even helpful for yourself. So you can just be going into it not feeling like, oh my God, I have to be interesting or whatever. Totally. Right? Well, especially if your podcast starts doing really well, people are going to be like, fuck, I got to be the best. I got to be like yeah. a better guest. And so you got to be like, no, no, no. Totally. Yeah. So is this, you haven't done any podcasts? No, I made a, like an actual decision not to. Um, so this is the first time you're doing a podcast. Two years. 
in two years. Yeah, and I've had to say, say no to quite a few because wow. I think a lot of people have asked about, like, it's almost like I, I think I got more podcast requests after I left than while yeah, I was in it. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I'm honored. <laughs> yeah, dude. But so why honor. me then? Because uh, you asked. Um, so it's been a while. People stopped asking. Yeah, after a year, we were like, okay, we get it. <laughs> He's never coming back. And you're like, shoot, I'm I'm a has been now. <laughs> yeah, dude, People this moved is what it on. feels like. Holy shit. Uh, and also, I feel like I'm slowly coming back into the world for these next six months. I'm going to start kind of like yeah. stepping back in. So it's good practice for me to be on camera, to have these conversations, to talk about what I'm doing, what's coming out. Totally. Um, and just prepare myself for doing this with our audience. Yeah. All right. Do you mind if we just kind of Dude. dive into that? Because there's so many things you just said that sparked a lot of questions in me. Let's do it. Um, is, does it feel good? Are there things that you missed, you know, coming back into the into the world, you know, like in showing up on camera or like, I mean, you said before we started that there's something cool about having a mic Mm -hmm. your, it kind of makes it feel like whatever you're going to say, even if it's dumb, is more important. <laughs> Far more. Do we should carry them around? Yeah. Everywhere yeah. we go, just yeah. talk to each other. You take that with you <laughs> to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, this is I, this is like the only experience I've, I've had, you know, in the last two years of yeah. doing this. So I can't really tell you. Uh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, what it feels like yet. Um, How does this feel right now? I'm a little nervous. Yeah. I okay. feel like strangely a little anxious. Um I think part of it is I ha I'm not like practiced, you know, it's kind of like when you, you haven't made a video for a while and you're like getting back into it and you're like, yeah, it, you know, I think just you're not really warmed up. Yeah. You know? But there's a different way of looking at it too, right? Which is that you're an amazing conversationalist. We've had awesome conversations mm -hmm. like in the last few days, right? So that part you're not rusty on whatsoever. And that's all we're doing basically. Yeah. Okay. There's cameras on and whatnot. And I made, and I took like an hour setting this up, right? So. <laughs> Maybe that's what did it, dude. The exact angles. I'm like, oh shit. Yeah. No, no, But no, you no, all kidding. on top of it, you know, oh, no, I can't. okay. So the idea that this looks good on top of it probably makes it worse, right? Uh, not necessarily. I think it's just me, dude. Yeah. yeah. I think it's just me. I think I'm, I mean, this is the reason I left, you know? Yeah. It was the cameras. I mean, that was a big part of the reason. Go, go into that a little bit more. Like, what do you mean? I'm 30 years old now, about to turn 31. Uh, when I was 23, I co-founded a YouTube channel with three guys I'd just met, um, Thomas, Amar, and Darren. We met in Montreal, and we bonded over the idea of doing things that would get us out of our comfort zones. We yeah. kind of felt like we, we were each doing our own projects, but we were all kind of developing our own routines and felt kind of stuck. And then when we met, we just synced up and... It was like an instant realization that there were other people that thought this way. And so it started with a summer project, 30 things in 30 days that we'd never done before. Just started filming together literally the day I met Amar and literally the day I met Darren. So from the beginning, the friendship was filmed. And it's almost that, that it's it's like almost too good of a story, right? Yeah. It's like who, you wouldn't believe it if it was written in a script. Right? Yeah. Even that, while writing the book, I was like, how do I make this sound? Like it wasn't fake, you know, because it's they literally the perfect characters just come in. Um, but I think that's also how it works. Once you're in motion with something, things just kind of start clicking really fast. Mm -hmm. um, so you guys kind of go all in to this. Go all in pretty immediately after a month of doing the 30 things in 30 days. It felt like a lifetime. Like we did everything from Thomas did a stand up without any preparation. I got my first ear piercing. Amar got waxed. We met the mayor of Montreal and introduced him to our secret handshake. Like it was just all over the city, all over the place, just nonstop every day, filming an episode every day and posting it. And after the 30 days, not only did we have a really great time, but we had built like a small audience yeah. of a few thousand people. And everybody thought we were insane for continuing, but we thought it was like we could see the potential. Wow. It's so interesting. I mean, obviously like I know this whole story and, I know, yeah, yeah. I know like what comes next, right? Mm. But what, what strikes me is the way you just described some of that first month together, you kind of set the tone and the rhythm for what was to come for the, the non -stop. next, like, well, what is it? Yeah. Eight years, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or six years, right? For you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then things keep going. They take off right away or like, yeah, it's funny. I was actually talking to a friend of mine who's a, a really successful entrepreneur and he, he was actually, he's one of my best friends, so he got to read the book. Um, and the first thing he said after he read it was like, people say things don't happen overnight. It's like, this happened overnight. 
because within four months of knowing each other, we got the deal of a lifetime and got to be on Snapchat in front of an audience of like tens of millions of people. Dude, wow. And uh, yeah, within a year we were live on Snapchat. They had moved us out to LA. We were doing the same kinds of videos, but just with the crazier budget, yeah, crazier resources, tremendous funded amount by of a billionaire. Yeah. yeah, funded by a billionaire. Yeah, Liz Murdoch, daughter of Rupert Murdoch. Wow. I think that's part of the thing is it, there was no time to process because it was like you're on this wave and then the, the wave just keeps getting bigger and bigger. You're not going to stop riding it, so we just kept riding and the episodes just got bigger and bigger. You know, we started doing a lot of stuff, asking strangers, you know, asking strangers to go skydiving, to throw a party at their house, to you know, <laughs> travel across the world. And the, it was almost like the, the more stuff we started to do with strangers, the more our audience started to, to grow and connect with each other. And that's in a lot of ways what we became known for is the um, getting out of your comfort zone by interacting with strangers. Uh, and it's hilarious because this whole time I was this dude, <laughs> same with Thomas, you know, like going out and meeting strangers and just nonstop action, all this stuff. Uh, and I was just anxiety ridden the whole time. Just so much anxiety. Um, now, okay. So I love how I'm going straight into this part. No, I love it. No, this is great. So I, and I think that's a huge piece of all this. Huge. Yeah. Was the anxiety getting worse or do you think it was like, how would you describe it? Was it there and you uncovered it? Was it getting worse because this lifestyle or did it not exist before? And it just kind of developed because of this. Like how, how do you look at it? It existed pretty hardcore. Okay, so it was there before. It was already there before I started. Yeah, I had a, a really bad panic attack when I was 19. Okay. Um, and it kind of stuck. Like, I stayed in that hypervigilant state, like, mm -hmm. constantly afraid, constantly anxious, especially social anxiety, which honestly nowadays is not that, it's not that new. You know, I feel like everybody's got social anxiety, but um, it was, like, severe. It was, like, a full-blown dissociative disorder, you know? It's like, that's how, what I was diagnosed as having um and this is um so that everybody's on the same page and also to help me get yeah. the definition clear this is when you kind of detach from your identity mm -hmm. there are moments where like how would you describe it well the specific way was depersonalization so just feeling like i had i was completely out of my body i had no idea who i was what these hands were how the what this everything felt like a dream state but a scary one it wasn't pleasant and um you just kind of feel like uh, a character you feel like you're making all these movements and actions and whatnot mm -hmm. but uh it's not like you directing it it's just kind of happening but you're kind of watching it happen almost like you know in that scene in get out when he's on the i haven't seat. seen it you never seen get out i i want to but it feels like a really intense experience, right? So From everything like, that I've seen. Sit down and get ready. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. when I'm picking the movie that I want to see, yeah, you know, I take into consideration the emotional impact it's going to have on me. Yeah. Anyway, it's sorry. First date movie. <laughs> you should watch it on a first date movie. Yeah, video. totally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, we'll yeah. do. Yeah, so I, and it, I mean, I've talked about this so much, you know, that to me it's kind of gotten old because it's I've like, this is my story. I had a panic attack yeah. and I got depersonalization. Then I stopped drinking. I used to drink a lot. And then just worked, 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 mm -hmm. started reading, reading, reading constantly just to try and figure out what was wrong with me. And then I, you know, I, I found entrepreneurship and it felt like a thing that could help me, like a, to get me out of my head. And so when you ask me, um, like, uh, did, did it exist before? Did it get worse or whatnot? It's like, I think the reason I, it did in part work with Yes Theory was the success took me out of my own head like I was like when things were going great and we were growing and th the thing was taking off it was like I felt it was like a high like I felt really really great um so I kind of stuck to that like I needed that constantly more and more all the time yeah um but the anxiety yeah I mean because I never, never really took care of it never really abated totally I yeah. mean you're a really sensitive dude like yeah. me and one thing that's really struck me observing you just like even before we did this is like the amount of 
uh, intentionality and effort that you put into just like trying to get in the right headspace. Mm-hmm. I mean, you meditated before this. Mm-hmm. I, I saw you kind of like hyping yourself up a little bit, loosening up, you know, mm-hmm. the deep breaths. Like I can tell you really, it's like a huge thing, you know? And I feel that as well. I feel sometimes I'm kind of like, you know, what, why am I this way? Like, why, why don't I see this more in other people where I have, I need, I have such huge needs for space alone or for like, uh, time to process things and whatnot that I don't necessarily see other people needing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think for a long time I didn't kind of explore that more because I was like, well, this isn't normal, you know, but I feel like uh, when you give yourself that permission, it becomes this extremely important thing. You know, you can't function. I can't function normally without doing certain things to keep me centered. Mm-hmm. You know, um, did you know, have you always known you were sensitive or did you find out later? I mean, looking back, it's, it's, it's so obvious. Yeah. Right. But isn't that a giant part of growing up where you develop the self-awareness that isn't there necessarily in the beginning? Um, and I mean, I'll tell you the truth, even even like in the last year where I've reconnected a lot more with my family after years being thousands of miles away and and, you know, living in different places and like becoming the adult version of me. I'll have conversations with them and they'll make an observation and I'm like, whoa, you really get how I operate. And they're like, yeah, no shit. You were like this when you were eight, you know, so yeah. you know what I mean? And, yeah, and yeah. that's like, oh, OK damn so it was really obvious all this time mm. you know but not to me and are do you think you're the most sensitive one in your family no i, I really? think we're a group of super sensitive <laughs> really? people yeah yeah i mean i think it depends on the the moment and the circumstances right like the sensitivity increases when i'm really stressed and mm. there's a lot going on um but no, there's a lot of sensitivity. And, and isn't that interesting? Interactions between sensitive people, like totally the, the ways you can trigger each other or whatever. Totally. Um, so it definitely makes all of us hanging out always interesting. <laughs> I mean, it, there's no such thing as like chill time altogether. Um, but anyway, sorry. So I, I kind of no, good, took us on a little bit of a tangent, but That's I think fine. it's really interesting kind of digging into the, the dynamics that we're already st- showing up for you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, as this process was unfolding and so many insane moments. So y- you're years into this now. Mm-hmm. Uh, when does it begin? Like how, how was the thought process of like, you know what, maybe I want to stop. And, mm-hmm. and by the way, I, I'm also asking as you know, a, another YouTuber, right? And the amount of conversations that I have with other content creators. I'm like, man, this is feels unsustainable or, mm-hmm. um, you know, what would life be like if I stopped like that pops into your head? That's popped into my head quite yeah. a few times. So yeah. walk me through that. Oh man. It was actually 2019. So, uh, almost, like four and a half years after we started. Wow, it's nuts. That's the year my channel took off, man. Really? I took a. I had a very different road with all this because the first four years of me doing my channel, it went nowhere. <laughs> like, for real? Yeah. You had been doing it for four years. Yeah, that's why your story is so crazy to me because the fact wow. that you guys had almost instant success, I'm like, that's so unrelatable. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is weird. Yeah. Let's talk about you, dude. So <laughs> like a lot. Yeah. Damn. Do you feel like that gave you a little more prep then for when it actually happened? Yeah. 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 I'm glad. Well, so I started even younger. I mean, I started when I was 17 and absolutely nowhere near the emotional maturity to be able to handle yeah. the shit that I deal with now. And even when it took off when I was 21, it was like, man, I'm really too young and too immature for this shit. You, you know? You felt that? Yeah. Mm. I was like, I, I am... I do not have the mechanisms, the systems, the life experience, you know, the, the perspective. So I, I mean, and obviously when you're in that situation, you just have to learn and adapt as quickly as you can, but I, and but, you're alone. Yeah. On top of it. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it, it, it was like, uh, and I actually want to ask this question to other people that took off later on too, because I think in some ways it's a real advantage to, to, um, 
not have a giant footprint mm -hmm. digitally mm -hmm. and kind of, what is it? Um, fly below the radar. Mm -hmm. And until you're like really solid in your life, you yeah. know, but then of course, I mean, there's no timing, this sort of thing, you know, and I, sure. and I don't regret a single thing and it's led me to where I am now, but no. the emotional distress, you know, when you're dealing with thousands of negative comments for the first time, yeah, it's a lot <laughs> just staring at your screen. It's crying. a lot. So anyway, so yeah. kind of back to what I was asking you, like, mm -hmm. it, was that part of it? Was that kind of what took you there? You're like, there's, this is just a lot. I think the the main problem I realized in, towards the end of that year was that I hadn't actually stopped to take care of the initial problem. Like I hadn't stopped to figure out what the hell happened in the first place. I had just replaced, you know, when like, you were 19, when I was 19. Yeah. Okay. It was like, I, I went from this like party kid to this workaholic. So I just honestly kind of replaced one addiction for the other. Okay. With the thought that the workaholism or just the, the success would, it would just like put that stuff away. And I'd heard it, you know, from every freaking successful person saying it doesn't solve your problems. But I was like, nah, they just don't, they just don't get it. It's like, once I get these things, I'll be good. Isn't that so crazy? Yeah. That you'll, you'll absorb very valuable insights or wisdom from people. Yeah. But like until you figure it out for yourself, it just kind of goes in one year and out the other. Totally. Well, I think a part of it is also, I, I'm, I don't regret it because there is something about proving yourself, like proving that you can do something. Um, and I'm really proud of what we did, you know, especially in terms of the community that we built. So I, I do think that had to be done. Um, but then in 2019, it reached, you know, it reached a point where there wasn't, I felt like I kind of reached, I had done all the things. Like mm -hmm. I, I felt like there, I was kind of running, like we, it's almost like I was trying to find other ideas that, mm -hmm were interesting. It was right after I'd done the Iron Man, which was like the biggest thing for me. Like I'd wanted to do it forever and found, finally found the time. So that kind of culminated into this, like, okay, I've done all these things and all these things that I thought were impossible. And there's actually nothing that feels more impossible to me now than solving the, what, whatever the hell's going on here. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually going to commit now to that. And it doesn't mean I'm going to stop making videos or doing what I love with the guys, but I, this has to be the priority. Otherwise, whatever I'm doing is not going to be sustainable. So, uh, yeah, in 2020, literally on January 1st, I uh, deleted my Instagram. I was like, oh, oh my God. Yeah. I didn't, I totally missed that detail. Yeah. But that, was still honestly, like the, that was the start of it. I was like, if I need, if I'm going to commit, like I say I am to this, um, if I prioritize, prioritize my mental health, this thing is like the worst thing for that. And that's like statistically proven, like there's data on that. So, um, yeah, I was, we were celebrating, celebrating with our family in Puerto Rico and my brother was in bed next to me. It was 2 AM. He was passed out. Uh, and I just pulled out my phone. I was like, I can't tell anybody I'm doing this. Cause I mean, I had, I had like, you know, a few hundred thousand followers verified. Everybody was very engaged. You know, we could have used that Instagram page for other things to right. change the name on it. Uh, but to me, it was more of a, this, like, fuck everybody, fuck everything. Like people tell me what to do. This is me showing up for myself. Um, do you regret it? Not a single day. Have I regretted it? Wow. There are moments where I, I think to myself, it'd be, it's like helpful for connection, you know, to connect with people. But the, to me, the, the cons outweigh the pros. Mm. Um, and it's funny when I got back to the yes house like a few weeks after the holidays amar was freaking out he's like are you out of your mind <laughs> he's like dude you had like three hundred thousand followers and you just fucking delete it permanently and i was like yep and before i would have been like am i an idiot what not what not, what not? but because i made that commitment to my mental health i was like oh, i'm actually proud of myself because you know people work their asses off just to get to this point yeah and i did too and now it's uh you know, now it's gone. Yeah. Wow, dude. Yeah. You know, that's the crazy thing too, is that you get looped in and you're like, damn, I have this valuable thing. I got to use it. Mm -hmm. I can't let it go. Mm -hmm. Right. It's hundreds of thousands of followers. Like that, that could be brand deals. That could be promotion for things. Totally. And then, and then the energy shifts. I mean, I relate to a ton of what you just shared. 
in the beginning, you're just out there going for it, got nothing to lose, you know, like, mm -hmm. we're just going to do this, we'll see where it goes, and it's so exciting, and then, like, doors open, and mm -hmm. you're having all these amazing, like, experiences and connections, but then, like, the further, you know, you're established at a certain point, right, and, and you keep going, and if you're not extremely intentional about it, it can become, how do I just keep this going, right, mm -hmm. like, how do I keep the fire burning, how do I, uh, you know, um, keep striking gold yeah and that for me i mean we've actually had conversations about the difference between like in dating the difference between like uh i don't know if you remember this in an audio message i sent you looking with the like the front part of your eye and the back part of your mm -hmm. eye or like standing on the front of your foot and the back of your foot there's a mm -hmm. different energy to it right there's like a you know uh, a jumpiness when you're kind of like yeah like too forward mm -hmm. and when you're more kind of solid and in place there's a different energy to that mm -hmm. and a different interaction with life in the world it's very abstract what i'm saying no, here yeah, but it seems like you're you're getting me here mm -hmm. you know i i think some of the decisions i've had to make for my own well-being right i'm not following anybody on instagram like i'm regularly deleting the app as well mm -hmm. it is a powerful tool but choosing to do these things even if it reduces how much you can maximize whatever engagement it helps me get back into that energetic position i mean it's so weird for me i'm still not used to a new format uh mm. you know, podcasting where it's long form like this because i'm so used to every second in the video being clear to follow along and clearly connected and yeah. there's not one wasted breath yeah you know but that's kind of also what's nice about podcasts right you just don't feel that pressure um to be like looking at it and getting it all perfect if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I think you can also like if you're listening to it, you can do other things. You yeah. Know, totally. Wash dishes, drive. Like you don't have to pay attention to every second. Yeah. Totally. You know? So okay, so this desire mm -hmm. to have it, honestly, is it a desire or was it like a necessity to live a different kind of lifestyle after a while? It kind of it built up and then you said on January first of twenty twenty it was just like boiling point. Mm-hmm necessity yeah yeah there i felt there was no other choice um it's a brave decision thanks man was it was it um do you feel it required courage or did you feel i just don't have a choice anymore looking back now i see that it was courageous i think personally it's just how i operate if i commit to something i'm like freakishly all in like extreme yeah so um it, it didn't feel like that much of a, I didn't have to like battle for weeks on it. I was just like, no, nah, that's so great. Is, you know, I think one of the, the big moments for me was a few days before, um, I'd been, I was with my family. So I was with my grandfather and I remember my cousin took a photo of us together. We were just like right after dinner and I was just kind of like leaning on his shoulder and he were smiling and, uh, she handed me the phone. It was my phone. And I remember the first thought in my head was, I wonder how many likes this is going to get if I post yeah. it. And that sounds like an awful thought, but how can you not think that after being so it's intensely everything. validated for so long? Everything. Yeah. It's like the first thought that comes up for everything. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, even like everything from my dating life was public. Yeah. You know? It's like, it wasn't paparazzi. I was my own paparazzi, <laughs> dude. I was like filming this thing. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, even for one of the girls that I was seeing, not to go on another tangent, but it's kind of related to this whole, like doing it for the likes. It's like, I kind of ended it with her via social media before I even ended it like fully in person. Like we hadn't processed the ending oh, man. before I ended it on social That's media. That's nuts. So it's, and then she reached out and she was like, what the what are you doing? I'm just like, what, what's going on? Yeah. Well, it was kind of both moments for me were like, wow, I'm kind of, I'm like, I'm like in this weird world where this is normal, but it's not. And I'm very happy. I caught myself. I was like, this is not normal. And now that I'm out of it, not to fast forward, you know, three years, but please, I mean, when I go back, you know, if a friend shows me their Instagram or I go back into this social media world, I, I'm like, I see how uh, it's like I'm pull, it's like a tidal wave. I'm like pulled in. I can't even, you know, and yeah. all of a sudden you find yourself and you're like, wait, I'm stuck here again. I'm back in. And like they, this algorithm just knows how to suck yeah. me right back in. 
after knowing that it's not good for me for this long. Um, I just realized like as disciplined as I want to be and I'm very disciplined, I'm never going to beat it. Like it's always going to win. I mean, dude, it's like saying I'm very disciplined, but you know, this intensely addictive drug just gets me when I use it. (laughs) You know, it's like, it just feels really good. I don't think that's that crazy to say, (laughs) you know? So I feel you too. It's like, um, I make, I'm strict about a lot of these things because yeah, you know what? If I start watching some Instagram reels, more time than I'd like will just go by. Yeah. You know? They, and not only that, everything after feels boring. Your dopamine is just yeah. Yeah. drained. So, okay. Did you struggle ego-wise with, like, the validate the re- reduction in validation? Like, all of a sudden, damn, you know, I'm not making stuff that gets tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of likes, mm-hmm. millions of views. Was that difficult? Or, I mean, how, how was that process in acclimating? Hmm. I think there's a level of trust that having a social media presence has nowadays. You know, if you're traveling and you tell someone, you meet someone and they're like, can I find you? And you're like, you actually can't find me anywhere. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a certain level of trust that I had that I lost, okay. um, which I think you can, you know, can be made up for, but um, I still do have this kind of fear of whatever I do next, you know, it's going to be much harder to promote it because I don't have, my own channel but a part of me also gets excited by that it's like there's something it's like oh i have to prove myself if what if for whatever it is you know um i also have like a really great network of people that i can tap into so you know i kind of assessed all these different fears and even recently you know it had it was coming up on three years um that i had been off and i, I was like should i just you know hop back on now that I've been off for three years and just like see how it goes. Hop back on to what? Insta. Instagram. I was like, let me just, you know, see how it feels. Um, And I really played it out of my head. I was like really considering it. I was like, oh, you know, it'd be great to promote future things down the line and connect with people and all these things that I want to do. And it's kind of like a toxic relationship. (laughs) When you leave it, when you're in it, it's horrible. But when you leave it, Oftentimes, if it's like this long lasting relationship, it's benefited you in some ways. And there were good, good moments. And you start focusing more and on the start, good moments. You forget all the shit. You forget how shitty it was. And so I caught myself again. I was like, I'm doing it again. There's a reason I left. And I'm doing way better mental health wise now. So why would I like, it's almost like the second I start to get better, it's like, oh, you know, I can, I can, you know, I can be back in that toxic relationship. Yeah. And again, this isn't to say like everybody's different. I know people who are really great with social social media and go on like once a week or, you know, briefly once a day. <laughs> the face. I don't really buy it. <laughs> no, but like not not creators. So like friends okay. of mine who like will post for friends. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I met a girl last night who didn't have a YouTube account. I was like, what? <laughs> you just almost <laughs> choked just now. I was yeah. like... No, but I just didn't understand. She's like, yeah, I don't use YouTube. I was like, what? (laughs) Like, I mean, I'm not, not, I don't follow. Because you told her you were a YouTuber? Yeah, I came up and she was like, oh, (laughs) let me, let me see. Like, and she's looking it up and and then she can't even, she wanted wanted to subscribe and she couldn't because she didn't have an account. And I was like, wow, that's kind of crazy. That's hilarious. But also, why do you want to subscribe if you don't use YouTube? You know what I mean? (laughs) You gave her a whole rant. Listen, listen, (laughs) I'm seeing some contradictions in your behavior now, but. Help her make an account and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> and then just like ruin her life with the new addiction. But it was just like, uh, you know, interesting to me just to see how much of an assumption it is. Like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. all young people are using all these platforms. And that doesn't necessarily have to be the case, you yeah. know, at all. It's kind of refreshing when you meet people like Honestly, that. Honestly, yeah. Like, I'm sounding like I was just dunking on this girl, <laughs> but I thought it was kind of cool, you know? Yeah. I yeah. mean, do you have a problem with it? I feel like you're pretty good. With YouTube? Just all of it. Uh, I, I just create buffers, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I YouTube's incredible for the information you can get and the niche channels that exist. And I'll pop on to follow some of my friends, you know? Mm. But I... Uh, also, just, I mean, I'd never have the app on my phone. I, I try nice. to make it harder for myself. Nice. YouTube Studio is its own evil poison, yeah. you know, except for when you're just in love with it, when you have a video that smashes, mm-hmm. right? 
Um, but it's also a long-term process. I think I had more of a problem a few years ago and then I deleted it for a while. Mm. And then I just got in the habit of like, if I don't really have anything to post, like I'm going to delete the app or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, um, or just, yeah, not really go on there. And it took a while, but eventually you create these habits where you don't feel, I don't feel like I have to be on there all the time. Nice. You know, um, but then, of course, I mean, life's always changing and evolving. And when it starts to feel like, you know what, this is a bit of a dependency again, I delete it again, nice. you know? So it's kind of how it goes, right? Damn, it's pretty inspiring. Yeah, yeah I mean, I feel pretty good about mm-hmm. about it. Um, but, you know, at the same time, it's like, what's that quote? Uh, it's no mark of success. Um to do well in a profoundly sick society. I'm, I'm really mm-hmm. kind of screwing up this quote here. No, yeah, no, you're um, about, you know, it's an interesting thought, right? And, and even if I'm, if I figured out a system that works for me, it's like a little bit alarming to see mm-hmm. this so widespread, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. but I was actually asking you earlier about like on an identity level, like mm-hmm. were, were you ever after leaving, were you ever like, who am I? Mm. Who is Matt? You know, mm. because I'm not Mr. Cool Guy doing these amazing things that a ton of people love, right? And everybody wants me to come back, right? I'm sure you got so many messages like, we're going to miss you, blah, blah, blah. Mm. You know, um, mixed in with the occasional probably like God, one in a hundred. Like, um, don't let the door slam behind you or whatever, right? <laughs> like I get those, I, I'll get those. <laughs> really? yeah, yeah, when I when I did the video about um, my choice to not live in the United States and kind of ex- explain mm-hmm. my general lack of interest in living in the United States right now. Um, and it's nuanced, of course, right? It, it's gratitude towards like the upbringing I had and the opportunities that I have, but like, you know, just basically explaining why I live here now and mm-hmm. why I'm, I'm good. And people will get so offended at that. It's crazy. I mean, yeah, makes sense. I mean, Americans, but so did you have this like where you were, Identity wise, yeah, where you just like, well, I think like the part of the problem was I that was the, the whole thing from the beginning is I I lost my identity. That was the depersonalization piece. Like I, even when I was in Yes Theory, I became while it was happening, I had no idea who I was. Like this, it is true that this character that I created was, uh, was potentially this thing I thought I might be. But as I stepped away, I was like, oh, that's not me at all. Wow. One of the things is interesting. I mean, that we talked about earlier is the sensitivity piece. I had no idea I was sensitive. Yeah. That wasn't even a thing. I was like, no, I'm so outgoing. I'm, I do so many things. Wait, so sensitivity and outgoing don't go together? Well, I, I didn't think so. You right. know, I was like, doesn't make any sense. I'm, I'm so sociable. But then I'm also very anxious when I'm too sociable. So, but then my ex-girlfriend uh, was like, you should check out this book. The highly sensitive person. Okay, I think I've heard of this. I forget who wrote it, but I read it and it was like reading my biography. I was like, holy shit. Yeah. And one of the things they say in the book is like this whole thing of over, like we're just so overly stimulated that oftentimes, you know, they, they have a, she has like kind of two different archetypes. She has like king warrior archetypes and uh, kind of like the um, um, advisor philosopher archetype and the, Sensitive people are far more like the the philosophers, the writers, the investors, mm. like very much less the people on the front line, like constantly taking action and like being public facing and just like always, you know, kind of in your face. And I realized like the work I was doing was not at all conducive to my natural characteristics. Yeah. And that was a big moment for me where I realized I wasn't actually crazy. It's just naturally how I am like to be out and about meeting a ton of people all the time traveling constantly not sleeping doing all the stuff that I've done for years was actually probably the worst thing I could do for how I'm built whereas like this one-on-one conversations or writing you know the book even though that's been really freaking hard (laughs) and uh you know just like not moving so much I my worry was that it was so boring I was like I don't want to be the freaking philosopher I don't want to be the the guy that just sits at home and thinks. I want to be freaking doing stuff, you know? I want to be, like, influential and, like, exciting. Like, being sensitive is not exciting. It's like, I, I saw it as being this weak thing. 
Um, but then more and more I realized the people that I loved the most and admired the most were actually the most sensitive ones. You know, it's oftentimes people who are paying attention and present and like genuinely care and feel. And, you know, in this overstimulated world of social media, like they're also overwhelmed just like I was. Um, and they've had to find ways to kind of work through it. So I started accepting that, you know, like that was kind of the first part of my personality that was like, oh, I am sensitive, you know? Okay. So that's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm mad, you know, I built this thing, but that wasn't really me. And now I'm sensitive. And, you know, I, I like, what else do I like? You know, I like salsa dancing, salsa dance. You know, that was, that's a new one where it's like, oh, I'm a dancer. It's like, I didn't know I was a dancer. I never asked myself what I was the whole time, the entire time. And this is the, essentially the purpose of social media for most people is what can I be for the most people? Like, and then forever, right? Forever. Because this works and I have to stick with this. I can't leave it. And it's in this the box. one thing, right? Like you can't be like 18 different things. Just yep. be the one thing because that's not good for brand building. Yep. You know? And then if you're not, people start getting pissed, man. Yeah. Yeah, they don't like it. Totally. And so you I really love... got to be strong to evolve. People are constantly asking me, uh, like, how would you describe your channel? Mm. And I, I basically give a somewhat different answer every single time. And I love that it's not easy for me to just explain in two sentences. I mean, thank God. Yeah. Thank God. I succeeded in being three-dimensional, you know? <laughs> like, and, and, and that's okay. If I, if I get punished by the algorithms or whatever because I'm, I'm kind of jumping from thing to thing and then my mm -hmm. life keeps evolving, well, you know what? Sucks to suck, man, because my life is dynamic, yeah. you know? And I, I, I think... Well, how would you describe it now? How would you describe your channel? Um... I mean, it, it really has always been about my journey through life and, and this kind of, in many ways, it's a little bit meta, but it's this practice that I have of attempting to be as vulnerable as I possibly can mm. and get to the root of whatever it is that's occupying my mind or occupying my life at, mm -hmm. a, at any given moment, you know? And I know I'm onto something whenever I'm like, damn, I'm stumped, you know, this I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with my love life or I'm struggling with deep relationships or I'm struggling with trying to find a home or whatever and then turning that into this mm. beautiful story that I can look back on, you know, because it is primarily for me. And when you do it, because it's so personal, does it affect the answer? As in like, you know, looking for my home, talking about it, and getting comments about it as you're processing this? Yeah. Like, is it affecting how you're like your pursuit of the answer? Well, I think it's, I mean, that's part of the practice, right? That there's going to be opinions. There's going to be criticisms. How well can I navigate that, you know? Um, and hopefully better over time in, in being true to myself, despite the fact that some people might not like this or that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's so hard. That's so hard as a people pleaser. And I'm so transparent about the search for validation that the channel was also mm. from early on. Um, you know, expressing myself, but wanting to be liked for that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, this is kind of the, <laughs> the, the deeper, hopefully, version of the, like, I think the haters, if you will, right? Because it's like, God... That's exactly what I need for my, honestly, spiritual development. Like I need people to poke my ego mm. and to really just put salt in the places where it hurts the most because mm -hmm. that's what I need to grow. Um, because it's just, it's just an idea I have about myself or it's just So it's not like a need, like a Michael Jordan style, like I'm going to prove you wrong. It's more of like a no, thank you for humbling me or... I mean, here's the thing. It's like I, at first I thought, I need to prove something to the world. And then later on, after I was realizing that wasn't quite clicking, I was like, okay, well, maybe I have, I have to prove something to myself, right? Not the world, but me. It's a personal mm -hmm. thing. And then like as, as time has gone on, and this is where it gets really abstract, but I'm wondering if there's anything to prove at all. Do you have to prove anything to anyone, including yourself? You know, uh, 
and and I can understand like the the Michael Jordan example, right? Like there is something it, maybe that's a step in the process. We're like, I'm just gonna see if I can do this, you know. But like for example, doing this marathon, like I have utter belief I'm gonna do it. So it's not really that I'm trying to prove to myself that I can do this. I have utter belief. It's just kind of a fun adventure, you know what I mean? Mm. And it's something I feel like doing right now. And I'm kind of curious about how running, of all things, is this can be this vehicle for connecting with people more deeply. Like I would have never thought, mm. right? But I've actually built some really amazing friendships because of this. And nice. I would have never thought that, you know? Mm. So that's like a stronger motivator for me. And, and also to, to learn about, oh, wow, I have this super competitive side to myself mm. that is crazy destructive because I, it will sometimes lead me to overcommit resources in the short term versus in the long term, right? We talked about that yeah. a few days ago too. Was that a new realization? That's a recent one because mm. I've never had to tr physically train for anything in my life. Like I knew this part of me was activated whenever I'd play games or sports and because I didn't know what to do with it and because it would just like spin me out of control so quickly, I just kind of avoided it. So this is the first time I'm kind of like, I'm going to approach this mm. and really see what I can learn about myself from this. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's a healthy place to be, dude. I mean, it sounds healthy. It, I feel great about it. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's been a journey because I think for a long time I was like, no, I got to prove I'm gonna Where did that come to you. from? Where did the, is that feeling like a loser? Like a young man's thing, or is yeah, that like... feeling invisible in high school or or even before. You know, being a small kid, um, sensitivity too. Again, it, it was this like I want to go deeper into things, and I want to I want to make art, and I want to do these things that <clears throat> a lot of other people don't get, and that's fine. Like we're not all built the same, but people would look at me weird. People would make mean comments, you know, and so. I was like, all right, jocks, this might be your peak right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to prove to you how much more awesome things are going to get for me down the road, right? <laughs> it's not a great way to yeah. you know, yeah. fuel yourself, but at least for a while it worked. And yeah. then eventually you realize like, man, this constant pursuing of stuff can be empty yeah. in, in some ways, you know? So, and that's why, like, we go back to the whole idea of like, it's really great for people to test me, the mean comments mm -hmm. or the people that really make me feel negatively. Mm -hmm. Like there's always something to be learned digging deeper into that. For sure. So I think also you touched on a really important point on the fuel for takeoff. And, and we talked about this, was it yesterday or two days ago? Where was like, we're I just think, hanging out every day. Yeah, we're hanging out every day, a few days that I'm here. There's this common misconception with, art or entrepreneurship or whatever you admire, you know, that the person who started it did it from an altruistic place or from a, you know, meaningful, not egotistical place. I'm just going to make the world a better place. <laughs> yeah, change the world. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I think, think it's easy a, for us to laugh at that because we that's can how see. We thought. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, I think there, that is a part of it. You have to think that way, you know, for it to be sustainable. Like it can't just be egotistical. But, you know, you describing... I think there's a line, it's like, there's no such thing as a billionaire who's cool in high school. Like, it's such a good, um, like, that kind of being misunderstood or being rejected is such good fuel. Because when you're that young and your ego is just, like, developing and you, like, you haven't proved yourself yet, you haven't been out in the world yet, and people are doubting you, it's almost like you're, you're just, like, kind of, like, you know, you it's like all this pressure yeah. and sometimes it's just like a conversation or it's a thing that snaps and then you just take off for me you know i write about this in the book at the end of the second chapter where it's thomas comes up with this idea for project 30 we're gonna do 30 things in 30 days that we've never done before and the whole story this whole time for years we all told the same story it was like i said yes on the spot a few days later mark came in then darren and then it just took off and then it was crazy and then when I included the book and Darren made me keep it, I, I tried to delete it. And Darren was like, we're fucking keeping this part. And I was like, son of a gun. He's like, it, it, the truth was I didn't say yes on the spot to Thomas. Um, like you in high school, high school was really hard for me. Always struggled with relationships with women. Um, 
and or like you know i had really bad acne by the way i i, I was also really short you know it's like, okay i was gonna say i haven't always struggled with relationships <laughs> Just to it's, clarify. It's more because because I think like, just like you forever, <laughs> forever, <my> whole life. <laughs> just yeah. <laughs> no, but I think it's an interesting yeah. point to to make because for sure, long periods of struggle. But I think what's interesting is maybe this is where you're headed. Mm -hmm. As you get more aligned with who you are and like what what makes you special, you attract different kinds of people, and I think like that that changes things. You know, for sure. But anyway, sorry. No, you get <laughs> just to clarify. Just yeah, just I, I'm doing straight out that point. In the dating anyway, department. Just, just killing so it. Knows. <laughs> just killing it right now. Not like high school at all. Not like high school at all. <laughs> this whole story we told everybody about Project Thirty and how everything started. That was partly true, but the truth was, I didn't say yes to Thomas on the spot. The truth was that I was madly in love with a girl and. Uh, I had a part-time job in my own business. Like I didn't have time to really think about doing a project like this. And I kind of wasn't going to say yes. Um, and then a few nights after Thomas came up with the idea, I was supposed to meet up with this girl that I'd been spending a lot of the summer with. So in love with her. Um, and, I, you know, we were flirting back and forth this whole time, and I thought there was something, and I was really excited. I literally, like, I know they say this about crushes and being in love and stuff, but I didn't need sleep like I could sleep three hours and be like 100% energized I could eat like a banana during the day and I was good like she was like few like all my energy was I was just like so excited I can imagine actually seeing you and you're sleep deprived and you're getting so skinny and it's like it's just a shit show but in your mind it's going great <laughs> everything's fine everything's fine uh yeah and then um and then she her and I were supposed to meet at this like, event in the city in Montreal where we were living. Um, and I showed up and it was like a packed house and she didn't come uh, for like an hour. And when she showed up, she showed, showed up with another dude um, who was like the hotshot entrepreneur in the city. There was a big uh, festival that he was the co-founder of. And... I like instantly she it was off like something felt off and you know we said hi and whatever and we had a mutual friend who had introduced us in the beginning so she introduced me to this guy and I was like you know kind of doing small talk he's twice my age literally um and then I went out over to our mutual friend and I was like what's happening like it feels off something's weird and my friend it was kind of like a movie he's like oh you didn't hear <laughs> are you shitting me that's what yeah dude oh man hear? that's really rough yeah and then, oh you dumbass yeah you didn't know you didn't know like, dude so... she doesn't care about you at all <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, dude, my god. Yeah. and so she uh he told me that they'd been dating for two months under wraps like oh, it hadn't no. been um they, had, they hadn't like if you want to call it that like gone public about it she if she like i doubt she even like remembers me at this point wow. you know so it's hilarious that I'm even talking about this, but I remember leaving the event and walk, turning the corner. My apartment was a few blocks away and I turned the corner and was walking straight towards it. And I just pulled out my phone and I texted Thomas. I was like, I'm fucking in for Project 30 and we're going to be the biggest fucking YouTube channel in the world. Period. Like, no question. And for a while that fueled me. I was like, you know, you start, especially for us, it's, it, you know, Within four months, we have this big deal. Within a year, we're on, you know, we're seen by all these millions of people. And I would check, you know, I would check my Facebook at the time and my Instagram and, you know, I would check people from high school, whether they were following me. And there they were like, I had people from high school that were like, holy shit, like that French kid that went to that American high school. And I would barely paid attention. It's like taking off and now he's working with these celebrities and he's got all these fans suddenly showing up and doing meetups and and i felt that validation finally i was like i got it yes i got it but it just couldn't fill like it yeah. never filled it it yeah. just wouldn't do it no matter how many people reached out telling me like dude i know we didn't talk much but when we knew each other but i'm so inspired by what you're doing you know, and I, I think that was part of the, you know, four and a half years later being like, 
oh, these things, these motivations that I've had for so long. And granted, those, like, even the rejection with the girl, that even after, like, a few months went away. Um, but overall, it's all the same idea. It's being unseen, not validated, um, not accepted into the group. And I think that's what a lot of creators and entrepreneurs do. Like, the reason, the only reason, not the only, but what I've found in reading and talking to entrepreneurs and artists is, like, the world you exist in does not, you don't belong to it. You feel like you don't belong to it. So what better way to exist than to create your own world where you can be king of that world and people can love you more than anybody's ever loved you and understand you and like relate and be your best friend. So you, it's like no different from a person like creating like a castle back in the day with, Mm -hmm. you know, all these people around that, they can spend, I don't know if that's how it worked back in the day. <laughs> Maybe in castles. I don't know. I don't know. Let's, let's ask the peasants. <laughs> yeah. That's a terrible analogy. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll check in with the lords and see uh, <laughs> how they go about this. <laughs> uh, but, you know, for example, I read Richard Branson's biography that, that was a huge, the founder of Virgin. Yeah. It was like my biggest inspiration. And I, you know, he was dyslexic. He was a high school dropout. Um, all his friends were playing sports and he'd been injured. So he was just like out of like what kids were able to do, you know, and that's when he started his first business at 17. So it's, I think it's, it's like the key I've found is allow yourself to use that as fuel for takeoff, but don't let that sustain it, you know? Perfectly. Yeah. I, I I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it really is. I mean, I'm I'm imagining some sort of metaphor with like a rocket of some kind, right? Mm -hmm. You need that special, I don't know shit about rockets, but you know, like the first part that take helps it take off Mm -hmm. and you let that go. There's a reason why you let that go, right? If it maintain, if they had to keep all of the whole rocket, like, I think that would cause all kinds of problems. Totally. Man, I sound so uneducated right now. <laughs> With but the hand you, gestures. Exactly. Too. But you get, you get what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, I get you, I get you. it's, it's so true, mm-hmm. you know? Okay. I think it's part of the journey. I think that's what makes it beautiful. It's like you have this initial catalyst, mm-hmm. this thing that propels you. Mm-hmm. And it's okay if the intentions aren't the best because we're all flawed as fuck. For so sure. that's, that's really, that's as human as it gets, True. you know? But then, but then I think neglecting to do the deeper introspection and figure out what's going on underneath, that's where things can really go wrong, I think. Um, and there'll be nobody who suffers more than you ultimately, or nobody who gains more than you by doing that. Because I found that, you know, trying to ignore these things or trying to keep it going, right? Like, I'll just keep making the videos at this rhythm or in this format that used to work or whatever. You know, I feel like the biggest loser because I, I'm just done. I did what I came to do and, Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I can't do it anymore, Mm -hmm. you know? And that, that comes with a bit of an emotional toll. Um, the what the continuing it or stopping yeah the kind of behaving a little bit like a factory right or behaving yeah. like uh, more on trying to act entirely on efficiency or output and not and letting go of the you know I guess I want to say the spontaneity and the experimenting and whatnot but it's more like clinging on to whatever worked in the beginning mm-hmm. if that makes sense mm-hmm. When we did our podcast, I interviewed this guy. I forget his name. Damn. <laughs> it doesn't sound good, but I'll have to do research on my own podcast. <laughs> it was a while ago. The thing is, for our podcast, we would interview like four or five people, and it was cut together into... Oh, wow. Yeah, so we interviewed like a ton, a ton of people That's in a short so much more time. work than is necessary. Yeah, it was a lot of work. Um, do you feel that that created a superior final product because i'm not sure that's necessarily necessarily. better yeah not necessarily i think people wanted more of this but i remember he said he had been a lawyer in his 20s and then uh he had gotten tenure as a professor wow and yeah i think six or so years into tenure um he decided to stop and become an author wow it's crazy every single person that he worked with called him out and And, and just for the record for for anybody who's who doesn't know what that is like tenure if i'm not mistaken it's like you you get that position for life with a university they pay you for the rest of your life right yeah. and well well 
you know, so and respected. Yeah. Prestige. Like, you say you're a tenured professor. I mean, that's very prestigious. Yeah. And on the flip side, letting go of that is, is like a slap in the face against the institution. Right. Mm -hmm. A little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause you're like, actually, I think I want to do this more, you know, yeah, the whole systems. And, but to the people around you, cause then they start questioning, wait, what am I doing? You know, it's like, that's the craziest thing. Your biggest, like, uh, you know, your colleagues or the people that are most aligned with you, when you start to shake things up, mm -hmm. you'll get the biggest reactions from them yeah. because they'll be like, whoa, 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 don't fuck this up for me. You know, I don't want to do the deeper searching yeah. or like, you know, the harder thing, the, the uncomfortable stuff that's bubbling up underneath. Like this is going well enough for me. And also that, and you're part of a system. So in a system, if you remove one of the pieces of hardware from the system, the whole thing starts to get a little bit clunky. Yeah. Like it doesn't, wait, no, you're supposed to fit in here because yeah. this is how we work together. Yeah. So all of a sudden it's like their reality is completely, it has to shift as well. So there's a level of just, no, please just stay where you are. Yeah. Um, but what I love what this guy said was, you know, he was detailing me and his book became a bestseller. Um, and he was saying, uh, the things in his life that he was most proud of weren't the things that he added. They were the things that he subtracted. And yeah. he used the analogy of the snake. He was like, when a snake, you know, I think it's like 12 times in a snake's life, you know, it's old skin is removed for a new skin or I don't know if removed is the best word, but just like falls shed. off shed. Um, we're not exactly snake experts. <laughs> we're rocket like, experts. Right? Yeah, yeah, honestly, <laughs> this is not that kind of podcast. I, I'm wondering if I'm going to be able to make myself look like a dumbass in every, every single episode. I think you should. I think it's key. It's interesting as well because that's around the time that I started thinking about this stuff. You know, this whole subtraction thing. Interesting message from the universe. Do you believe in that? Yeah, for yeah. sure. You know, I'd been adding my whole life. Yeah, it's like I just gotta. You know, we had three multi-million dollar businesses. Yeah. Thing was everything was working we had like you know with fan of a fan ended up having like 80 employees dude, dude that's okay i it, it's interesting about that is that like when i was younger what you're describing is the life i thought i wanted and and as i got closer and saw bits of that like what you're describing to me sounds not for me i yeah. mean for some people it would work great but that sounds like an insane amount of responsibility. Well, the responsibility, like even for Phantom Fan, which is like the majority, I think we had like 60 employees wow. at the peak. I think the, um, it's like delegation. Like I don't touch it. You know, Ryan, who's our partner is like fully. No, but I recognize that. But yeah. I mean, it's like 60 people that, that are making a living doing this. Right? right. And for sure. All of that stuff. Right. So you feel that, you feel that way for Absolutely. sure in everything you do. But the whole point being like, you know, even like to give you, actually, this is probably the best example is, uh, two and a half years into starting yes theory, we had, uh, two people kind of come into our world, Perry and Mia. One Mia was my brother's girlfriend and Perry was a close friend. And Mia was actually the girl that found us, found yes theory and brought us to LA. Um, and together we were like, well, we have, you know, we're building it's, our audience is still a little small, but we have, they're loyal and we have more and more connections in LA. So we should start a production company. And so we all got together and we we're like, yeah, hell yeah. We were living at this 506 Westminster. So we're like, we're going to call it 506 productions. <laughs> and we're going to be this like in-house young creative crew that like comes up with different ideas from traditional media. And we're going to pitch a bunch of these, uh, streaming networks, et cetera. Uh, I must say from the get-go, Thomas was like, this is a horrible idea. It's like, we're already struggling with YouTube. We got to just stay focused. Amar and I were like, shut up. Like if we, we got to, you know, many baskets, many baskets, <laughs> many baskets, Jeez, you want to, you know? And so, uh, <laughs> many baskets. Was yeah. that the analogy you guys <laughs> Dude, used? I had a tattoo. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Oh my god! It was like many baskets. <laughs> you oh my god! You got me there for a yeah. second. But what what the hell does many baskets mean? Like 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 to protect yourself, just like add 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 like many places like eggs in baskets. I right. Guess. Okay. Or so it's it... from that analogy. Yeah. I guess. All my yeah, eggs yeah. in one basket. Okay. So Instead eggs in a basket. bunch of baskets. Okay. Precisely. Many um, baskets. Many baskets, dude. Many baskets. Thomas <laughs> was like, "What does that mean?" Like, he he did it. too. No. no. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm, I'm inclined to believe what you're going to tell me here. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> the rest is true of what I'm saying. Right. Okay. Um, Please don't, please don't, um, what's it called? Pathologically lie Lied on my podcast. Yep. I'm not even mad from yesterday, dude. Yeah. <laughs> God, this isn't me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, you could almost, like, if you were to make a graph of when we started the production company and where the channel was at, it's like, <clears throat> just as we start the production company, the channel just starts sliding down. Oh, yeah. Like views, subscribers, engagement, people liking the videos, our enthusiasm for the videos. Yeah. And about, I think, like six months into it, or maybe a year, actually. It took us a year to realize this, but we weren't really getting anything. We'd gotten like two music videos for the production company that barely paid anything. Uh, and then Thomas and Darren actually was with him on this. They sat us down. They were like, pick one. Can have both. If this thing is going to work, we got to go all in. And it's interesting. I mean, this was like originally Thomas's channel. Like he, he's the one that did, yeah. started. And like he was the guy for YouTube. So I think he saw that more than we did. That like if we just figure yeah. YouTube out, we'll get the rest right. Um, yeah. And, and we agreed. Yeah. We were like, yeah, we just got to. You're right. We got to shut it down. The second we took down 506 Productions, it was like the opposite yeah it's like that pure focus within six months the will smith that you know we were helicopter bungee jumping or that incredible was accepted by will and then you know crossed a million etc and that was another moment where it's like just subtract just focus like focus what do you want like if if it's all these different things you can have them it's just going to take time but you've got to pick the first one first and make mm -hmm. sure that thing works and i had never i'd like that was my first lesson in business where that happened. Um, but I'd never applied it to my own life. Like in my own life, I was like, no, I got to make more friends and I got to freaking go travel to more countries and I got to build more and do more and be more every which way. And I think what started happening, you know, in these past three years was everything started getting subtracted. Yeah. It's like, and that doesn't equal a smaller life. A bigger. It's the opposite. Yeah. Much bigger deeper yeah it resonates with me so much more totally. it's me and that's so cool it's great to hear that man because i mean there's such an emphasis on especially in your 20s go accumulate accumulate mm. accumulate go 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 go, yeah. go you know actually all through life but i feel you know in your 20s you, you're like all right i'm fresh you know i got nothing let's do this yeah. you know add it up baby. add it up just <laughs> i'll figure out the bill later <laughs> exactly yeah exactly make it rain so it's just completely, you know, you have that kind of young, crazy energy, right? Um, but again, it's like the problem is that can work for a while, but if you don't pace yourself, that, that is just, yeah. It's like, I mean, again, running analogy here, but that's how you get an injury, right? Like, mm -hmm. so I actually think it, it is essential pacing. I think, I think in your 20s, especially early 20s, to go, go all it. out. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. No, okay. And, and to give a little bit more context here, I don't regret any of the stuff that I've yeah, done. Yeah. And I feel like you, you don't Not either. No. But, you know, there comes a point where it's like, all right, maybe I do shift gears a little bit. I mean, this is, this is how the Roman Empire failed, mm -hmm. right? Watch how I make myself <laughs> Here we go. be a dumbass yeah, rocket in the eyes of the Roman historians. Empire, maybe yeah. add it up. <laughs> but it's true, right? Like the Roman Empire, empire expanded and expanded and expanded. It just had to keep conquering forever. Yeah to feed itself right and eventually you're exactly you're so spread thin that you yeah. can't keep up with all the barbarians you know what i mean yeah. and like man i'm on fire with these analogies <laughs> honestly but tell me more about the barbarians yeah, yeah. <laughs> chaos chaos is <laughs> i can just imagine like this terrible movie that I'm, <laughs> I'm like i'm narrating i'm the narrator for the for the trailer that'd actually be a hilarious parody and the barbarians are coming <laughs> barbarians were at the gates yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know it's exactly that mm, and i feel like yeah. i mean this is why i say burning out is a rite of passage at this point you just gotta do you gotta do the crazy sprinting yeah you gotta see where the edge is yeah, until you're just like oh my god i'm so spread thin what the fuck is yeah, going on yeah. all right let's t let's figure out what matters yeah right and that's life. Life is about figuring out priorities. For sure. You know? And I think the thing is, 
the, the danger is the denial about that. You're like, no, 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 I can do this. I can, I can, I can do all my, I can accomplish all my dreams and I can do it all. And actually it doesn't work like that. Exactly. I think you gotta, you have to be selective. Yeah. Sometimes going all in, as you described, can open a bunch of other doors, but you first have to kind of say no to a bunch of stuff yeah. and see where that leads you, you know, and, and in many ways, I mean, it must be exciting. The doors that will be opening up for you now, right? For as sure. you're at this kind of crazy uh, juncture in your life. Yeah. And I think the key is to not jump in too soon, you know, to whatever comes next, just kind of be open. Yeah. And patient. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Um, what are some of the lessons that you learned or things that you would share with someone who hasn't been through the whole life cycle, you know, like regrets maybe, or just like particular pain points that you were unaware of that you can only see now in hindsight. Hmm. Well, I haven't been thankfully through the whole life cycle yet. So I, I can't say <laughs> all the way. Um, I mean, you are pretty clearly not on YouTube though, right? Oh, I thought you, I thought you meant like actual life cycle. Are you talking about YouTube life cycle? I'm talking about like, I guess the journey you've been on as a, as a content creator, right? Oh, I like, see. I see. That's what I mean. So specifically content creator related. I mean, I guess your relationship with social media and, and this career, I mean, you've, mm. you've, you're already doing a very different thing, right? right? Writing a book and I would actually say, don't do it. Really? Mm hmm. Don't do what part? Don't be a social media creator. Oh, like do something else. Do something else. Really? Mm hmm. Unless it's really you, like Thomas, for example, is a YouTuber. Yeah, that man yeah. is born for that platform. And he has a special ability. And he's just, in he's, my opinion, top, top. Yeah, he's made for it. And so are you, you know? Uh, not, no, not, not in like that way, Thomas. Not but like, Thomas. like in a different way. But you're made for this kind of like, you know, video content, even like, you know, you didn't have to film this, but you enjoy kind yeah. of that kind of storytelling. I like making things. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of people are doing it not for the right reasons mm. and doing it because, I mean, what's the, there's like a crazy stat, like 80% of kids want to be YouTubers or TikTokers. Or TikTokers, right. Yeah. And I think that's the problem. I think it's got to be said that it's like there are other things that are cool and that are worthwhile and that will help yeah. you grow just as much if not more and this is coming from someone who's seen that world yeah it ain't it if it's not for you it ain't it yeah it's really not at all what you think it is if you've never done it I'll, I'll add a little bit of nuance and depth maybe to this answer. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear if you agree with this. Maybe you don't. Please, yeah. Which is don't do it if you don't have other things also in your life. You know, I think it become a big realization I had is that it's a lot easier to tell stories or to make things when you have things to say. You know, I don't, I don't particularly enjoy the feeling of like, damn, I have to figure out what I'm going to say this time or this week or this month or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, I don't like that. I like going out and chasing stories and, and living life. And then maybe later that can be mm -hmm. a thing that I make, but the pressure to find a story so that it can be this cool thing that I make, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. And I found that just social media, it's this empty thing. It's like this very, it's a cotton candy, you know, and it's a lot easier to navigate it when you've got other things going on. I mean, a lot of my favorite channels I've noticed are people that have like this other career, like they, like they're, they work, they're a woodworker or, you know, like a musician or whatever. And then they use this as a tool to convey their message or connect with people or share information. It incentivizes this entire lifestyle that doesn't, you get further and further away from who you really are and what you really care about. Right. Because you're like, damn, I got to do this because this would work well. And, you know, that's the side of things that not a lot of people talk about. They're just like, oh, I just want to build a successful YouTube channel or have my TikTok take off or whatever. You know, that, that, can, that can become extremely empty and extremely draining for, uh, sure. for a while. Just as it can be this incredibly fulfilling thing if you have that right balance. Definitely. Right? So, and I feel like I felt both extremes. Just really, 
I don't know. I kind of wish I was told that. I, you know, I wish somebody said something along those lines. Like, you can do this. Go for it. It's really, it'll, it's a crazy, really cool life in some ways. But make sure it's not the only thing. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Um, two things. One, I actually stole that um, from Elon. And <laughs> when Thomas met Elon, because uh, he went to Draper University, which is like an entrepreneurial school. And Tim Draper, the founder of the school, is an investor in Tesla. And this was early days of Tesla. And they, he brought like 20 of his students, including Thomas, to see Elon. Um, and Thomas asked, I think it was Thomas that asked Elon. He was like, what advice would you give for, you know, an 18-year-old entrepreneur wanting to do what you do? And Elon was like, don't do it. Unless you, like, essentially, when, I, when that, that phrase is like, unless you know why you're doing it, and it's not just because you want to be this famous whatever, don't do it. It's like, it's like, I, he had this hilarious line where he's like, it's like eating glass while, <laughs> I forget, just like, it's excruciating. Like so, if, but what do you think, I mean, okay, it's really funny that this comes from Elon of all people. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Who okay, does everything? He's building a lot of other <laughs> yeah. stuff outside. But he's Mr. Mr. Twitter guy, right? Yeah, yeah. And and I think I mean a lot of it seems strategic. A lot of it's like, what is it? Uh, there's no such thing as bad publicity. So he just he's just really good at being in headlines and whatnot. You know, do you feel like that's a little bit contradictory right there? Uh, I actually don't know because probably it's the part. I mean, I would guess. Gosh, this is really me just kind of venturing out and and creating conjectures here, but. That might be the part of his life that makes him the most miserable, right? Like just the just the negativity that swirls around so many of the things that he does, and everybody wants him to shut his mouth. But I also think he's, I mean, the greatest entrepreneur of our time. You know, even though he's just like you terrible. Know, that's, that's become an increasingly controversial thing to say. You know, it is. But the I, negative sentiment around him is oh, massive. Very, very increased. aware of that. I'm talking like it's like you know you might not like Michael Jordan, or. You, I don't feel like you can put Michael Jordan and Elon. But I'm saying in terms of like entrepreneurial skill, I'm not saying like personality wise, you can hate him. That's not the point. Like in terms of like shifting entire industries, mm. not just one, but two of the like space and cars simultaneously. Well, and it, the, the thinking behind Tesla being not just cars, right? But energy and all of it. All of it. Yeah. So you can't deny the skill. Um, I don't love that we're not talking about Elon, but uh, <laughs> I, I, the whole point being, like, I for me, I, there's another stat I, I remember seeing, like, <laughs> X amount compared to, like, the 60s or whatever, there's, like, same, around the same, like, amount of kids that when you they ask them what they, like, the, what's the thing they're striving for the most is to be famous. You know, like, yeah. everybody just, we just want to be, we live in a culture where that's the, that's yeah. the currency. And so the... Well, it's never been more the currency because fame... I mean, honestly, I feel like you could answer that now. Say, I want to be famous on social media or whatever. And not even be talking about fame anymore. It's, it's, it's something else. That, that, that can so easily be converted into money, for example. Mm -hmm. Right? Or status. Yeah. Damn, dude. Granted, I'm saying that from a place of having done it. So it's kind of hypocritical. But yeah. um, I also realized maybe too late that it wasn't for me. Do you regret anything? Mm, ever? Or just with this Let's whole process? Let's say, so you're 30. Mm -hmm. Do you regret anything about your 20s? Hmm. These are fucking no. super tricky questions I'm asking you here, so. No, no, you're good. <laughs> no, I, uh, no regrets. Um, well, I have regrets, but I'm not, I guess it's kind of weird because I'm not regretful that I did because the regrets were essential in learning the lesson. Yeah. You know, so for example, like, uh, I regret that I wasn't more present, you know, because it went by fast. You know, I was caught up in a whirlwind and I got lost in it. And all of a sudden I was 30. I was like, oh shit, wait a second. I wasn't present for any of that. I was like, I needed to get to this place. And then I got to the place and I realized I didn't enjoy or spend as much time as I'd like enjoying yeah. what happened before. Um, but again, like that's, that is an ins essential lesson for me going forward. Totally. I cannot forget it because I spent a whole decade just in a hurry. I was in such a hurry. I just like, God, 
Like, you don't understand. Everybody get out of my way. Like, there's nothing else that matters. Yeah. This is all there is. But again, the lack of regret is that obsessive focus for that amount of time mm-hmm. is why it worked. And having built this thing, it's made a lot of parts of my life really secure. And I honestly don't have to worry about getting a job or like, what you know, I'm confident that I'm good. But I know a lot of friends who are around my age who, and not even just my age, like older guys that I've talked to, who are like, I never built the thing. I didn't build the thing. Mm. Like, I don't have my thing. My mentor actually said that to me. He was like, I, you have your thing. He had built like a few pretty successful businesses, but not like anything that really stood out. Uh, and I'm really grateful that I have have this thing that I can be really proud of and that I didn't, the guys and I did not sacrifice our values for it. Like we really pushed a message that I'm really proud of and still do when we could have gone the other way. There were a lot of temptations to be like clicks, man, dude, we would have YouTubers come into our house who were like flying on trends, crushing yeah, and trying to sell us on it. Be like, dude, just do more of these videos, you know, like, um, like spending 24 hours overnight in random places was a big trend for a while. Yeah. And we had one of our friends who came in and he was like the, one of the big guys in that. And for a few months, maybe even a year, he was soaring faster than us. But we just like always got together and we we're like, that's just not who we are. It's going to take us a little longer, but we just got to stick to our values. And so now looking back, I'm, I'm just like so proud of that part. Um, and now I'm just really grateful I get to focus on other parts of my life, you know, yeah. like my relationships, where I want to live, um, taking time off for the first time as an adult, you know, just like, what's that like? Holy shit. You know, most people take their gap years or travel in their early 20s, backpack through Europe. It's like, dude, I was freaking grinding. Yeah. And I got the travel, but it was work. Like we showed up, we filmed, told a story hung out with the strangers for a day or yeah. two and then we boop, back to LA video next week yeah. same thing over and over travel travel no, I mean travel. dude I don't envy that at all not one yeah. bit because I saw the behind the scenes I mean I, I, I see how it goes you know and and that's the extreme danger and I, I use those words not lightly at all extreme danger of hurrying right because it's like this it's like it it tricks you because you're like, well, it's just this time, right? And then it and then it can quickly become every single time, you know. Yeah. And that that is scary. I mean, I'm trying so hard to be as intentional as I possibly can, and still, there are moments where I'm like, damn, mm. that was four years ago or whatever. That's crazy, man. It's, but you, I feel like recently you've started to realize that, no? Yeah. The yeah, I have, I have, I have. Has that been? Do you feel like you've improved in that way? I think so. I mean. I think so. I think the way I described, maybe this was to you a few days ago, but certain realizations take place, right? Like, oh man, I, I just can't do this anymore, right? And then it's almost like there are cracks in the foundation, but good cracks. Like this kind of light is streaming in now and I can't ignore it. Like, mm-hmm. damn, I'm just incapable of that lifestyle or that rhythm anymore because I don't like how it makes me feel and I don't like the quality of the work that I do because it has an impact on the mm-hmm. quality of the work. I can't go back to that, you know? Um, and so the bigger struggle for me has been a lot more like the identity part. This is why I was asking you about this earlier. It's, it's this, I'm so attached, so caught up on Nathaniel Drew, this guy, you know, that, I mean, I, I didn't grow up even being called Nathaniel. Really? You know that? Yeah, it was Nathan. Really? Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, and so Nathaniel Drew. Why did you make this, it Nathaniel? I don't know. I think it was a chance to reinvent, mm. and, and it sounded a little bit more poetic, profesh. Mm. Um, it does. I, di- I didn't like it growing up, but for some reason, it just had a better ring right around the time I was trying to have all this take off. You know? Can I call you Nathan? Is that cool? Yeah, I actually tell most people in my personal life to call me Nathan. Really? Okay. Yeah, because it's because the funny thing is, like, when you call me Nathaniel, it, you're basically saying I know you from YouTube. Mm. You know, and 
Like, what, what, what makes you laugh about that? Oh, I've been calling you Nathaniel all this whole time. That's no, okay. I don't care. I mean, I, yeah. there's a part of me that also doesn't care. There's people who call me Nate, and I've never once mm. told somebody to call me Nate. Mm. <laughs> you know, so people will call you whatever the fuck they want. Not, not. Yeah. Um, and I stopped getting hung up about that a long time ago. But anyway, yeah, it was like this mm. kind of identity that I created, this guy, mm. this really cool guy, you know, Nathaniel Drew. Like, a lot of people like that guy, you know? And... Um, and to get so clingy to that, you know, like, fuck, I can't lose this. And then to explore that fear, right? And to be like, well, what happens if I lose it? Mm. There's this kind of liberation, this sense of freedom that is so massive mm -hmm. on the other side of that. Um, but, but in between me and that, or, or, you know, the, where I'm at in the spiritual journey and being there is fear really mm. and it's this and it's attachment and because so because it's worked well because it's you know it, it that's a good question it, it's i think what makes it so scary are the things that you think you need right like the safety and the comfort and the i'm important i won't be forgotten mm. i won't be you know i matter mm -hmm. it's like those deeper underlying things underneath and to let go of Nathaniel Drew is kind of, I mean, my mind, right? This isn't the true, this isn't actually the reality, but in my mind or for my ego, letting go of Nathaniel Drew is kind of like, I'm not going to matter anymore, mm. you know? And that's kind of why I asked you this because it's, I think it's so powerful for me to meditate on this, you know, and to be like, okay, that's, that's where my discomfort is. Like, that's where I can grow. And that's also, the, that realization, boy, this conversation is so abstract. I hope people are going to be able to follow along you with good? this. Yeah, it's great. That realization of like, wow, that's so insanely uncomfortable. Because I also kind of live a life where it's not even necessarily by choice. I just feel like I have to go towards the things that scare me. It makes life more meaningful. When I realized that it was scarier to contemplate this, to let go of this guy, this identity, than to go to the other end of the world and make some cool video. I was like, fuck, well, okay, the decision's been made then. I can't mm. just keep doing that. Mm. Like, it, there's this thing that's in me that follows me wherever I go that I gotta face, you know? And by this, are you saying the, almost like this identity death, if you wanna call it that, is that and, specifically related to, you don't have to call it that, but just like end of this identity, is that related to, YouTube specifically and content creation or are you saying like overall in your whole life? I think this is extremely multifaceted. Okay. First of all, I'm not describing a, an ego death or anything like that. Right. But identity, I, like right. A, this identity or identity death, because ultimately like I'm still going to have my attachments and I still mm -hmm. have these things that I care about a lot and likely for the rest of my life. You know, I think I'm just trying to loosen it up a mm -hmm. little bit, like 1%, you know? <laughs> yeah. Dude, it's so funny. Cause I, do you remember the other night when we were here and, uh, I forget what was, I think you were like fixing the candle or something. Yeah. Yeah. It drives me crazy when they're yeah. crooked. And you, and you fix it and you came back and you're like, man, I'm, you started kind of like talking to yourself and you were like, man, I'm kind of crazy, aren't I? <laughs> it's like, I'm so obsessive with this stuff. Like I really need everything to be perfect. And then that, you kind of went on this little monologue where you're like, but that's, that's why it works. That's like, why, that's what makes me me. I mean, wait, what am I even saying? I'm Nathaniel Drew. I remember you saying, you saying it so powerfully. You're like, I'm Nathaniel Drew. And I, I was like, isn't it amazing that like just saying that is representative of like how you see yourself. It's like, you know what that means. I am yeah. Nathaniel fucking Drew. And I think like when I heard you say that, I was like, I was actually quite inspired to, like to talk about yourself that way is I think really powerful. It's like, no, this is who I am. Yeah. I mean, wow. We're getting into really, really <laughs> nuanced territory here because I think, yeah. I mean, this is so interesting because I think it, for me, it is extremely valuable to care a lot about things. I think that's what I mean. I'm not trying to refer to myself <laughs> in the third person. <laughs> You know what I mean? This guy's this is how Nathaniel talks to himself. <laughs> when I come to the door, he's like, This guy like, thinks hi. he's a prince or something. <laughs> it's like, hi, I'm Nathaniel Drew. Yeah, dude, we've met <laughs> many times. Yeah. No, but so yeah, I mean I think there's 
there's something there, right, about realizing I care about these things and I operate in a certain way. But at the same time, that's that's a little bit different than like saying in that context, it's just I care about these things and that's okay. You know what I mean? I got that kind of obsessive side to me. And that's okay. Versus I need people to love me and care about me. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And that's the attachment to Nathaniel Drew mm-hmm. that is dangerous. Um, and it's also very human, but that I'm also just working on. I'm trying to, I'm trying really hard to be honest with myself and honor the fact that I care about this, but can I be a tiny bit less attached to it? Mm. Because letting go of it entirely, let's just be realistic here. I'm not a monk in the <laughs> mountains, right? Um, Thankfully. But what I think is so incredible is even that 1% change on that. Mm-hmm. Here I am sounding like uh, James Clear, right? But seriously, yeah. like just getting a little looser with these things. Yeah. It's like there's more space to breathe. Yeah. You know, there's more, oh, wow. I, I can do, I can take, I can make less decisions. I can make... Uh, do less things, take less actions on behalf of this idea of what I think I want or this idea of who I am versus what I actually care about or what I actually feel in a particular moment. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's going from externally driven to internally. I think it's a big shift. And like you said earlier, you know, you have less to prove. It's interesting. Uh, I was having lunch with Thomas Two weeks ago in LA, he said the exact same thing. And you have brought him up like a hundred times. I write about him every day. So yeah. <laughs> it's like top of my mind. <laughs> Freaking book, once it's over, I'm never talking about Thomas again. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> but he is like, you know, the main character to the story for me. You know, he's taught me so much. And I, it's interesting because he said that. And I feel it too, the lack of needing anything to prove now. And I think once you don't have anything to prove as much, there's like way more room for risk taking. Hmm. So you're like, oh, I can kind of do whatever I want. Yeah. I can leave. I can change these things about myself. I think it's harder to, it's almost like a, a version of like spiritual bypassing. What's that? But like, con- or like, I would call it like success bypassing or work bypassing, spiritual bypassing. It's like people who are all like yogi, you know, like uh, Buddha, peace, all peace, whatever, and seem like they're woke but haven't actually done the work to be woke. Oh, yeah. So, um, Isn't there something particularly repulsive about that? Truly. You're like, wow, you're taking this sacred thing yeah, and you're just like yeah, making it a part of your ego and your identity. Like, God, yeah, it feels really awful. You know? Yeah. But I think there is the same thing with uh, like success in your work life, you know, where you, as much as it may not be healthy for you, it does help to work your ass off and well to know what that's it, like. Yeah. To get, again, like you said, and get, also to figure to out your edge. boundaries as well, right? Like you right. have to do unhealthy things to figure out what's healthy exactly. for yourself. I'm not saying that that should be a habit or whatever, but you, you need to know what your boundaries are. For sure. Right. Because somebody, what, what looks unhealthy to one person might work for another person. Mm-hmm. You know, you were talking about this, the, the, this new life that you have, that you thought was boring, that is boring to probably a lot of other people, but that works for you, mm-hmm. right? And great. Mm-hmm. Like, damn, the world would be a better place if more people just did that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the issue is we're all promoted the same type of success or the, like what is the thing to be. And so you're like, if I'm not that thing, then I'm not cool. Yeah. You know, but I think it's just growing older, you kind of care less and less about it. You know, it's part of the maturity. Yeah. Um, should we talk more about Thomas? Because <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna watch this and be like, "What the fuck?" Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was. Uh, do you, does he have a crush on me or something? <laughs> <laughs> Always, dude. Um, wait, did I interrupt that anecdote though? Which one? You were saying you're talking about. You were so the story, the anecdote that you shared about Thomas. Where it, he was saying the same thing that you told me. Yeah. I have nothing to prove. Yeah. And he seemed like you can tell how much more re- relaxed he is in yeah. his position now. And all, all that being said, it's like the reason you don't have anything to prove is because you've already in a lot of ways proven yourself. Yeah. And so you can't get to a place where I don't have anything to prove dog. It's kind of like that bypassing. It's oh like, yeah. You can't see. Oh, okay. I pretend see that saying. you don't care yeah. when deep down you're like, no, I, I like, I haven't 
it's yeah it's kind of like the friends of mine who like don't feel like they built the thing yeah. it's like build the thing that would be my advice yeah. build it you can't skip to that you can't skip yeah. to it yeah yeah man it's such a crazy journey the whole thing <sighs> and that's why i do believe you when you say no regrets because there have been some insanely intense painful moments <laughs> But thank God I got to experience those things. You know, yeah. I really strongly feel that. And it also, I think if you can kind of really absorb those things and not hurry through those moments as well, it turns you into a more compassionate person because then you can really feel for another person's pain. 100%. And that, I think, that makes you more human. And forgiving, you know. We're all doing trial and error. Yeah. It's like, dog, it's just part of the game. Do you think you'll ever do uh, any social media stuff again? Uh, I think I'll have a newsletter. That's not social media. I guess not. Uh, But I probably won't do Instagram or YouTube or any of that. Now, you're willing to to face the consequences of like, I mean, they're really powerful marketing tools, Mm -hmm. right? So are, are you okay with launching something in the future and just through a newsletter? Yeah, like just not using these tools. Yeah, I think that's fine. I think, honestly, I'll probably have a newsletter. I'll probably have a podcast at some point. Um, been talking to a friend of mine for a while about it. Probably not for another. I can't get back in this game too soon. Um, Why? Too fresh still? Too fresh. Still? I think if I start like a company again or a project, that can have an Instagram. Like the, the thing itself can be on those different right. platforms. But it's not you. But it's not... Because if I'm confined to this box on this platform, it's really, like you said, hard to break out of that identity. So I'd rather keep myself fluid, but keep the things I'm creating, you know, more fixed than a human would be. Totally. Um, so that's kind of how I see it. And it's kind of like really exciting for me to do it my own way. Because when I go on those platforms, you know, if I'm with a friend, he's on Instagram, it just feels like blah, 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 blah. Yeah. There's just so much fucking noise. Yeah. Whereas a newsletter, it's like, you know, it's within certain emails and a podcast. It's like, you have to be very intentional. Like if you're going to listen to a podcast, it's like, you know, showing up, you know, you're going to spend an hour at least. I'm being extremely intentional in the moments that I show how much of a dumbass I am. What do you mean? Just like these analogies that are falling apart before my eyes. (laughs) Yeah. All the... (laughs) You know, my knowledge on rockets and whatnot, I planned that. Okay? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's a yeah. m- elevated degree of intentionality to this. Yeah, dude, it's on the, that you have like a whole sheet of notes about what you're going to say. <laughs> exactly. You said it really well. Rockets. You see yeah. the handwriting? <laughs> rockets. Mention rockets. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, man. Wow, dude. Well, honestly, really enjoyed chatting with you. Same here, man. I'm, I'm going to guess that this is going out before the book is out. So, Mm -hmm. you know, so excited to check that out. Thanks, dude. I appreciate it. And, you know, I can't wait to read it. I know you've been working your ass off on that. On that point, is it it just been insane working on the same thing for such a long time? (laughs) For two and a half years. Uh, um, I don't even think insane would describe it. It's been like, it's ineffable. I can't even put into words. It's changed everything about me, and it's pretty fucking good. <laughs> and it's taking a long time to get to that point, dude. Good things um, take all, take, take time. time. Four different, you know, four different versions. Three other versions. I wrote a whole whole three different books and deleted all three. And this one has taken another year to get it down. So, it's, I've never worked on anything a single project this long. Uh, by my, I mean, by myself, like with me as the head and then yeah. with help from Darren and my writing coach, Razul, who you introduced me to. Yeah. It was amazing. The number one lesson that Darren told me for it was because I was rushing. I was like, dude, I'm like a year into writing. I realized I wanted to leave Yes Theory. So it's kind of like writing about your breakup. It's like I'm I'm still writing about the stuff we did six years ago, but I'm I'm good. I'm I'm ready to go. And halfway through, I was like ready to completely ready to quit. Told everybody. Amaro was the only one that was like, you're not quitting. You're finishing this freaking book. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. And I was like, God, <laughs> dude, <laughs> let me leave. <laughs> uh, 
And that was like probably the kindest thing he's ever done for me because it's as hard as it's been, man, have seeing where it's at and that I have this like I'm able to close the chapter in this way. Yeah. With all the lessons that I've learned and I mean the lessons that you learned just writing the book itself, right? There's something incredible that happens when you go through some crazy difficult painful long experience i mean we talked about dude this we talked about, about this a lot but yeah it teaches you so much about yourself yeah and i mean again it's the cracks in the foundation that's mm -hmm. what life is about i think it's like you build up a, a, a sense of self an identity an ego of this kind of idea of a foundation right and then the rest of life i think is undoing it really totally and it's just like let the cracks come in baby you know because yep. I, I really think that's where you learn about yourself that's where you grow that's where you know you're it's almost like your depth is multiplied right <laughs> and um all the older people that i really respect and look up to and em have embraced this process instead of denied it you know mm. or like um the shedding kind of the unlearning yeah like okay this is what life is throwing my way mm -hmm. and uh and letting go of i guess the ideas of invincibility that we have Mm -hmm. when we're when we're young so yeah rock on dude well thanks, thanks man thanks well i appreciate honestly your support throughout this process has been amazing even just the past few days just i've had some low lows even here you know and so having friends like you that can just kind of pick me up when just nearing the finish line is key so totally, dude i mean you're on an interesting path and i yeah i don't even know where it's going n none of us do nope None of us do, but that's that's what's so cool about it. That was a conversation with Matt. As I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, I will leave a link to the newsletter that you can sign up to to get updates about the book that he's been working on, as well as links to how you can support this podcast if you're enjoying it. And with that said, thank you for listening.